أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأقسموا بالله جهد إيمانهم لئن أمرتهم ليخرجن قل لا تقسموا طاعة معروفة إن الله خبير بما تعملون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Away to the Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam, my respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What are the principles of an Islamic economic system? And particularly, when we think about an economic system that liberates people from exploitation and from oppression. We stated yesterday in our first part of our series that we are inshallah going to be looking at how our investment into the local community is part of the Islamic economic system which seeks to be able to liberate people from the challenges of their lives. We stated that one of the main principles of Islam is to be able to liberate people from exploitation and oppression. This, as a principle for Islam, informs the Islamic economic system. The Islamic economic system, therefore, informs the aid that we provide. For any organization to be able to provide financial relief to anyone, this cannot be independent of the Islamic economic system, and the Islamic economic system cannot be independent of the goals of liberating mankind from the challenges that they have. And therefore, one informs the other. We also stated yesterday that often what tends to drive our Muslim humanitarian organizations tends to be certain principles. For example, it will be the interest of the donors as to where the financial resources of the community reaches. You and I will certainly have a soft spot for certain causes. We also find that the aid organizations, they will regularly advertise to you and I. And so we will be seeing certain repetitive messages about where money needs to reach. We also know that aid agencies have a specialist knowledge about what is happening on the ground. And therefore, these three principles tend to combine. And this is how we end up spending our sadaqat, our khumus, and our zakat. We stated, whilst this has certain benefits, actually from a Quranic perspective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us a holistic vision of where our charitable resources should go. And it is important not to be able to reduce that number. We often have a lot of time to support certain charities and certain causes. We make sure that orphans, wherever they are, are supported. And this is absolutely right. This is mentioned within the Quran. Those who are the Aramil, those who sadly are widowers around the world, we will support them, and rightly so. But we also identified yesterday that there were certain avenues 
for our investment and financial support that maybe the community had not even heard of. Therefore, we reduce the number that Allah Jalla Jalalu has provided us for avenues of being able to support within the community. And as an outcome, because we reduce that number, we do not have the right sort of balance as to how we actually support the community in its entirety. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in many verses that we are actually supposed to spend where Allah has told us to. And not only in the directions that you and I as donors want or as aid agencies want the financial resources to reach. These assumptions that we have made are the backdrop for our series. And what we wish to be able to do in this series is three things. Number one, we wish to be able to reflect on the principles of an Islamic economy, particular to liberating mankind from their challenges. We want to be able to explore the fullness of those avenues that are mentioned within the Quran. There are some 16 different avenues by which we are expected to invest into in our communities. When we reduce those to five or to 10 or to three, then of course not the entirety of the community is reflected as a liberating system. What are those 16? And in that relationship, we are going to be showing you a number of presentations from local UK-based charities that are in accordance with some of those that we may not necessarily be so accustomed to. And the third thing that we wish to be able to do in our series is to have a very deep exploration of a particular fiqhi mas'ala. And that is the issue of what is known as itq. Itq or fakku raqaba is to free slaves, to emancipate slaves. By and large, the emancipation of slaves today from the Muslim community has all but stopped. Even though this is mentioned several times in the Quran and mentioned a number of times within our ahadith. For example, God forbid, if one of us breaks our fast in a haram manner, one of the kafarat, the three kafara that we have to pay is freeing a slave, right? You fast for a certain number of days consecutively, or you can feed a certain number of poor people, or you can free a slave. How often do we know that modern day slavery occurs in front of our very eyes? It was only this year during the pandemic that slaves, modern day slaves were found in Leicester, for example. Do you remember that story a few months back? The problem has been the way in which we have interpreted slavery has been rooted in its historical understanding. When we think of slaves, we immediately think of someone being shipped from Africa on a boat, for example, to America. Or we think about it in the context of 1400 years ago, Arabia. One of the things that we'll do in this series, inshallah, is have a detailed discussion on modern day slavery and how this is one of the 16 avenues in which we can actually free people, not on the other side of the world, but people that are living within our own city. How do we apply it in the modern day context? These are some of the discussions that we will be taking in our series over these 15 nights. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. For tonight, we wish to be able to start by reflecting on four principles of an Islamic economics system or an Islamic economy. We're going to talk about four things that are not supposed to be present within an Islamic economy to negate them. And then we're going to speak inshallah about one which is going to be a positive thing, which is an affirming thing within the economy. Divine teachings always revolve around the principles of justice, virtue, and benevolence. And they are at war with all that is undesirable and unjust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us within the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna Allah ya'muru bil-adli wal-ihsan wa ita'i dhil-qurba wa yanha'an al-fahshai wal-munkar. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoins us towards justice, kindness, and giving towards our kindred. And he forbids us indecency, wickedness, oppression. And Allah exhorts you towards that so that you may take heed. Surah An-Nahl, verse number 90. With this in mind, an Islamic economy cannot be separated from the divine laws of creation. What I mean by that is, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu prescribes certain laws. I don't mean ahkam fiqhiya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a system. And in that system, when human beings act, the system reacts to the way in which we do things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this in the Quran his sunnah, his divine laws. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that his sunnah, his ways do not change. Meaning that Allah Jalla Jalalu has constructed this world within certain laws. And that the universe is conscious of our acts. And that the universe responds back to the acts that we do. When we harm the planet, the planet will respond back in order to defend itself. When we harm the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the system of justice and truth, will respond back to us. And believe me, you me, we are not as powerful as that system. That system will do away with us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this within the Quran on a number of occasions. He talks about, for example, previous civilizations. And he says, have a look at these civilizations and notice how every one of them was exploitative as a system, every one of them was oppressive as a system, and as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did away with them. And then he states, those people who set up an exploitative system, the reality is that they think that their world is so strong, but actually it is no stronger than the web of a spider if only they knew this. Very famous set of verses. Everybody knows the verse of Ankabut. Few people know the verses that are leading up to it. Have a look at this set of verses. Chapter number 29, verse number 39. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to describe the previous civilizations. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa Adan, wa Thamuda, wa qad tabayyana lakum min masakinihim. And Ad and Thamud, what happened to them is obvious to you from their ruined dwellings. The fact that they were destroyed and the Arabs knew where they were. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is saying to them, you used to frequent where, where they used to live, where their dwellings were. They're obvious to you. وَقَدْ تَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ مِنْ مَسَاكِنِهِمْ Iblis made their deeds pleasing to them and diverted them from the path of God, even though they had been able to see the right way. The same fate befell upon Qarun and Pharaoh and Haman. And Haman. Musa alayhi salam came to all of them with clear evidence, but they chose to be arrogant in the earth and they could not escape our punishment. For what happened to them? We seized each of them for their wrongdoings. Upon some, we sent down a storm full of stones. And some we seized with a blast from the sky. And some we caused the earth to swallow up. 
and some we drowned. Look at the different punishments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذْلِمَهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَذْلِمُونَ It was not Allah that did an iota of injustice to them, but it was themselves that did injustice. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes this series of verses with the verse that we know so well. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أُولِيَاءَ كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ اتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتَا the example of those who take protectors other than God is like that of the spider that made itself a house. Sorry. The weakest of houses is the spider's web, if only they knew. An Islamic economic system is not like a secular system where it imagines itself to be separated from God or the responses of God Almighty. A Western economic system imagines itself to be free of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first foundation of an Islamic economic system is that it is actually rooted in the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, when I say rules, I don't mean ahkam fiqhiyya here. I'm talking about the divine system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you oppress, the system will respond back to you. If you leave your phone on during the majlis, you will get told off. You see the divine system, how it works? <laughs> Assalamu alaikum Sayyidin. The system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is set up in a way that it is responding to mankind. It is part of the system. It is not separated from the system. And therefore, when a system is not built upon truth itself, those laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have to respond to those economies that are exploitative by their nature, that are oppressive by their nature. Do you think that what we are going through at the moment in this global pandemic, do you imagine it to be outside of the realm of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, outside of the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, outside of the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you think that it was permissible for mankind to go on destroying its own nature and that nature would not respond back to us? Do you think that we could go on exploiting human beings and the universe not respond back to the human being and put them in their place? Do you not imagine that when the system sees that human beings think that they are above the system of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us that with something as tiny as a single virus can bring our entire world to its knees? Do you think we are above and beyond that? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system is present and it is responding back to us at all times. Therefore, a system, an, an Islamic economic system has to be within the purview, the watch of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is understanding that everything that we do has to be built off the back of haqq and off the back of justice. Otherwise, the system itself will respond back to us. Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi al Mudarasi, in his discussions on Islamic economics, he makes an important point here. And he poses an important question. He says, Have you ever thought about why cyclically? From time to time, be it decade or more, there tends to be an economic crash. The last major economic crash was in 2008. The economic crash that we are being exposed to is occurring at this moment. He poses a question. He says, do you not think, do you not take time to ponder as to why that there are cyclical economic crashes? 
Standard economics will use certain language. It will say this was a bubble. The bubble was always due to burst. Ayatollah al-Mudarasi says, the bubble that we create for ourselves is thinking that we can go on exploiting people and that this bubble will not burst. That actually this can only go on for so long before the system has to reset itself or respond back. Now, based upon this context, that an Islamic economic system is not secularized, it is within the purview of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, we wish to be able to present four elements to an Islamic economic system that must not be present, and then one, inshallah, that is present. And this will create five principles for the Islamic economic system. It may be that we don't get to go through all of them tonight. We may have to continue this discussion tomorrow. It is a series of 15, so we will explore it as much as we can. The first principle of an Islamic economic system. Now, all of these different parts that I'm going to mention to you have to be seen in light of liberation. I'm going to use a certain term, which I will come back to time and time again in this series, and I will explore it later on, inshallah. And that is the term liberation theory. Liberation theory is primarily a theory that has come out from the Catholic school of thought, mainly in the 60s and 70s. And it was first inaugurated by people of South America. The theory goes as follows, that the way in which the Bible should be read is that everything that Jesus السلام, came with was to liberate the poor from the clutches of the rich. Now, I'm not agreeing with this. I'm giving you some context to the language of liberation. Anyone who has read the book, for example, or the works of Paolo Freire, there is a work called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I don't know if anyone has come across it. It's considered to be one of the greatest books on education theory of all time. Paolo Freire postulates that economies are set up and created to teach the poor how to be able to serve at the behest of the rich and create a system whereby the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Pedagogy is a form of education. Pedagogy of the oppressed. It's basically leading the oppressed to be able to continue a form where they are oppressed, continue to serve their masters who can exploit them. In the introduction of this book, or at least in the introduction of the publication of it, the, the version of the publication of it, it talks about people in the 1960s in South America, in Brazil. They were so poor that people had to go to dumpsters and eat from the carcasses of human bodies to be able to survive. These are testimonies. I won't talk about the detail, especially not before we have our iftar, in case our appetites, I don't know, increase or decrease depending on you know, what kind of person you are. Mohim. But actually in the 1960s, the level of poverty in South, in South America was so much that people had to go and eat from the dead flesh of other human beings. And you can read this in his works, Paolo Freire's works. Coming out of this, the Catholic movement reinterpreted the Bible and said that if you read it properly, Jesus has come to liberate the poor of the world from the super rich. And so Christian liberation theory was created. And until today, it is one of the most powerful theories. Certain Muslims adopted this theory, particularly Muslim scholars during the apartheid in South Africa. If you wish to be able to read more on it, there is a sheikh by the name of Ishaq 
Farid, uh, I think. Sheikh Ishaq. Farid, I think. He has written a number of books on Islamic understanding of liberation theory. Islamic liberation theory is very different to Christian liberation theory. In Christian liberation theory, you set up a war between poor and rich. In Islamic liberation theory, we do not set up a war against the rich. Lady Khadija السلام, was the richest woman of her time. Someone who has wealth, there is nothing wrong with that inherently. It is all about what we do with our money. Islamic liberation postulates the idea that anything that stops a human being from being able to worship Allah Jalla Jalalahu to the fullness of his potential, that thing has to be liberated. That thing has to be broken. That chain has to be broken from that person in order to help that human being reach the fullness of their potential. Islamic liberation theory is not just about economics. It is rooted in spirituality. Therefore, Islamic economics that liberates people is not just liberating them from poverty. It is liberating them from anything that stops them from being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? Let me give you a simple example. You'll understand it brilliantly. We stated yesterday that one of the 16 avenues that we're going to talk about, it's a sensitive conversation, maybe a certain shabab they, for this lecture, that lecture they can be outside or a different part. There are those, may Allah help them, who will sell their bodies into prostitution to pay for their own lifestyle. They'll need to be able to do this. Christian liberation theory would have said, if they are poor, we are just trying to support them out of their poverty. And Islamic liberation theory says that we're not just helping them out of their poverty. We want to help them to break out of that practice because the practice is inherently problematic as well. Can you see the difference? There are some people that are situated in lifestyles that are exploitative, that are haram. Islamic economic theory, because it is linked to God and godliness, it is not just about lifting people out of poverty. It is about lifting people out of anything that stops them from being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. Anything that is going to be decadent on human society, anything that is going to become oppressive to the soul, Islamic liberation theory postulates to break people out of that. Therefore, an Islamic economic theory works in tandem with liberation theory, that the finances that we give to people, that the resources we give to people are not only just for the sake of helping them out of their poverty, the finances that we put in are also to break the shackles that are upon people's hearts and minds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this within the Quran. That everything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi brought was to lift the burdens off people's shoulders and to break the chains that were upon them. This is what an Islamic economic system ought to do. Based upon this, there are four areas of the Islamic economic system that we wish to be able to explore. The first we will talk about tonight and maybe the second as well. Number one, an Islamic economic system cannot be based on any polytheistic ideals. That may be obvious, but let me explain how deeply inherent or deeply part the polytheistic systems of shirk were at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In chapter number 53, Surah Al-Najm, verse number 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you a question. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَ الْأُخْرَى Have you taken time to reflect, to consider, to ponder upon Allah and Al-Uzza and Manat, the third, the other one? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has what is known as istifham. 
Does anyone know what istifham means? The root is from faham. Faham means to understand. Yeah? Istifham is asking you a question so that you understand the matter. Right? This is istifham. This is Allah asking you a question so that you don't miss the point. So that you take time and you say, Allah has just asked me something. Let me take a minute and actually consider what is being said to me. Have you considered Lat and Uzza and Manat? Who knows? Who was Lat and Uzza and Manat? Who knows? Three of the gods, the idols that were present within pre Islamic Arabia. The three daughters of Hubal, the Ahsant. You know, there were a number of different idols in Arabia. Some of them had been imported. Some of them had been created from Arabia. And each of these idols actually had a certain role in the minds of the people of Arabia. Some would give you daughters. Some would help you win wars. Some would help you have an increase in wealth and so on and so forth. Most famous was Allat, mentioned in the Quran, which was found in the region of Ta'if, around whom they'd actually built a sanctuary. Closely associated to Lat was Al-Uzza, found amongst the Iraqis and the Quraysh in that part of the peninsula. Arabs considered Al-Uzza the most reverential to whom they gave offerings and special sacrifices. This was actually placed within the Kaaba itself. Al Uzza was placed within the Kaaba itself. As Sayyid just mentioned, amongst the Arabs of the Quraysh, they saw Allah and Al Uzza as the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Banatullah, for whom water springs were built and gifted to close towards the Holy Kaaba. There were other deities that the Quraysh used to believe in. There was Su'a which was worshipped by the tribes in Medina. Yaghuth was mainly an idol for the women to worship at. Ya'uq was located in the sanctuary near Mecca. An idol called Felis was worshipped by the tribes of Tay. That was actually destroyed by the hand of Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Banu Khuza'a actually had an idol called Dhu Khalsa, or Dhu Khalsa, which was carved out of white stone and had a crown placed on it. There were many other, other different idols. These idols, different tribes had different idols. And so when you wanted to be able to utilize that idol, you would have to go and give it an offering. So I've done this before in lectures. I think many of you might have seen this if you've been in my lectures before, even at IUS I've done this, but to explain the economy that was present that was based upon shirk. Say, now if you don't mind, you, you, you will be the God of, you'll be Lat. Is that all right? Yeah. Say Ali, you will be al Uzza. okay? And say, Musa, you will be Manat, right? I'm just giving you an example, right? Now imagine, I'm not saying that this was the case, but I'm helping you to understand how the economies of shirk were at that time. How it was based on exploitation through idols. So my friend Lat here, you will be an idol for, what would you like to be an idol for? Say again. Yeah, okay, increase in risk, okay? Say to Ali, you are Uzza, what would you like to be an idol for? Asan, water and rain here, yes? Thank you. And Manat? God of war, of course, Sayyid Musa wanted to be a god for a god of war. Yes, okay. So now, all of you at the back as an example, the sisters, you decide that you need to go and place something 
at the behest of these idols because you want something from them, right? This was risk. You want risk. What did you do? You would travel from all parts of Arabia to this particular idol, to this tribe who owned this idol, and you would grant it its offerings. You would make brocades, silk, gold, silver, animals, and you would place them worth thousands, worth millions at this particular tribe's idol. You were God for water. Of course, in Arabia, everybody needed water. So let's say you were running short of water. Now we would do Salat al-Istisqa, right? We would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rain as an example. What would they do then? They would go to this God and they would say, all of our offerings, we would make clothes, we would give sheep, we would give gold, we would give brocades, we would give it here in the hope that water would come to us. And Sayyid Musa, God of war, aptly named as he is, if you wanted to go to war, and as you know, in the Arab tribes, there was constant wars, wasn't there? This was something that the Prophet ﷺ stopped by making us one ummah and not considering it you to be tribe against this tribe, against that tribe. So every time you went to war, which was quite often, you would have to go to Sayyid Musa and give him brocade. You'd have to give him gold. You'd have to give him horses and camels, sacrifice them at the idol of this particular tribe. Now help me to understand this. Islamic economics, or even Islamic economics, economics. <laughs> Who, which is the direction of wealth being exchanged? In which direction is wealth moving? From you in this direction, correct? You are giving hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars every single year, here, here, and here, correct? If you don't have an idol, or at least a big important idol with a big crown, that makes funny noises, that looks good, that doesn't get eaten by foxes during the summer. If you don't have an idol, is anyone coming to you to give you wealth? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. So the movement of wealth is in one direction. Which direction? This way. They don't need your idols. Your idols are small, they're not important. Maybe you don't have an idol. So there's no movement of wealth going this way. There's only a movement of wealth going one way. Now that's important, isn't it? Because now, if this Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa comes and he says, there is only La ilaha illallah, we need to destroy Laat and Uzza and Manat, who for the last hundred years has been getting richer and richer and richer? This tribe who owns Lat, this tribe that owns Uzza, and this tribe that owns Manat. Do you think these tribes are going to be happy with the Prophet Muhammad for destroying the idols or not? They're going to be desperately unhappy, aren't they? So they're going to go to war with the Prophet. They're going to say anything they can to be able to protect their wealth. Who is getting richer every single year, every time that there is a need for rain, every time there's a need for risk, and every time that there's a need for war, which is constant throughout the year? Who's getting richer? These three. And who's getting poorer? Who's having to give away from their own properties? The rest of the people. The economic system that was established in pre-Islamic Arabia was based on this, an economy of shirk, which was so exploitative that the gods of the main tribes were every day being given sacrifices to, and who do you think took those sacrifices? The tribes of Allah, and the tribes of Al-Uzza, and the tribes of Al-Manat. The movement of wealth was unidirectional. The poorer got poorer and the richer got rich. And the rich used these gods to be able to enfranchise that system, which was all based upon the exploitation of all of you at the back. And you had no choice in it because your system was based upon this. 
Your theology was based on this. Which one of you was going to stand up and say, I'm not going to give to Allah. I'm not going to give to Al-Uzza. I'm not going to give to Manat. Who was going to do that? The only person to actually do that was the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The system, the first system that was established was a system upon shirk. And this needs to be understood. That for you and I, our own system cannot be based on shirk in any way. It cannot be that we create idols. And again, I use idols with a small i here. Anything that we create as idols and that we constantly give in to that system. We constantly are at the best of that system such that we, the ordinary person, become poorer and poorer and poorer in order to invest in those idols that have been created by our social systems. That does not match with the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as a last point on this particular issue, and then we'll conclude for tonight because we want to finish before half past, allow ourselves time for Maghrib and to return home from iftar. You know, sadly, and this is important to understand in the context of Islamic economics, you may say to yourself, yeah, sure, of course the idol worshippers had a system based on idols and then utilize those idols to become richer. That makes sense. Actually, in Arabia, even, even Ahlul Kitab also created their idols and place them in the Kaaba in order for them to partake in the system of shirk and financial exploitation. They felt left out. Hadith comes to us, narrated by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, about the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Hadith is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 4. Book number 55, Hadith 570 and 571. The Prophet entered the Kaaba in order to destroy the idols and found in it pictures of Prophet Ibrahim and Lady Maryam. Think about that. Whom? Ibrahim and Lady Maryam. At that, he said, what is the matter with them? Have they not already heard that the angels do not enter into a house in which there are pictures, yet there are pictures of Abraham and Lady Maryam? And why is it that he is depicted practicing divination by arrows? The point I make is that it wasn't just the idol worshippers, the mushrikeen, that were using idols to be able to maximize their wealth. Ahlul Kitab, those who were supposed to be monotheists like me and you, fell foul of the system and decided to also get our own. You heard that saying? I'm going to get mine. You can't let these guys get all the money. You need to get mine, right? Papa needs a brand new pair of everything. Right? What happened? Even Ahlul Kitab partook in that system, started creating idols, placed them within the Holy Kaaba itself in the hope that they would also be given sacrifices and that they could take them as well. The Muslim community also has to therefore be warned that it doesn't partake and set up a system based on idol worship, an economic system that creates idols and then make sure that we feed into those idols as an outcome, we end up participating in that system of economics based on polytheism and shirk. This brothers and sisters is the first issue about what is not supposed to be in an Islamic economic system. Inshallah, tomorrow we will continue and we will talk about the remaining points about a system not being based on exploitation and the redistribution of wealth and also dealing with austerity, which is something that we need to be able to talk about in the context of our own time. Inshallah, this discussion has been of benefit to you. Please do take time out to reflect on these discussions and inshallah, if you have any questions for the last couple of minutes, 
I'm happy to be able to take them. I think we have two or three minutes before the end of the lecture. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma sallallahu ala.